everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening there, and uh, thanks for joining our talk. Uh, this is really the first time, you know, me and uh, Ibrahim, uh, you know, presenting in the this summit, and very excited to, you know, um, share some of the, you know, our impractical experience, and also certainly um, talk with more people here. So first, a quick introduction of the company. The actually. You can see it's called a Mist, a Juniper company. Mist was uh, almost a five to six year old startup. It was founded in 2015 to really solve this network operational problem, use big data and machine learning. And Mist got acquired after four years. Uh, startup journey got acquired about one year ago by Juniper uh, Networks. So now we are part of the big Juniper family. And our talk today is uh, uh, automated pipeline for large scale neural network training and inference, in which we are talk, going to talk about the theory and also the ML of sort of a real model example in the solution we build. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. My name is Jixian Wang, and I have been most working in the enterprise industry in the last uh, 12 years, you know, applying big data and machine learning to solve different enterprise problem. You know, before me, I was most focusing on the enterprise security, and uh, now it's enterprise networking. So I will let Ibrahim talk about him, sir. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this pandemic time. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to have this presentation. Uh, about my background, uh, I have a PhD in electrical engineering about uh, 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 learning cognitive learning networks. And after my PhD, I have worked in different areas of data science, including information retrieval. And now I'm working with MIST. Around three years, I am with MIST. So I have worked in different projects, including inference engine for the chatbot that we have, and animal detection, outlier detection, and now we are working through different projects. So, also, so uh, I'm here to share some ideas that we got through the development of animal detection and scaling that into production. Yeah. So before we jump to the details about the model, I want to spend some time because probably most of the uh, you know, audience are new to this uh, industry. So just to probably spend a few minutes talking about really what the problem, what's the business problem we try to solve here, you know, as, especially as a startup before. So as you may know, uh, Wi-Fi actually has been in enterprise industry for almost uh, two decades. And Wi-Fi started as what we call the good to have as a more convenient way for user to connect like say gas network, you know, this is the best example. And the fast forward uh, two decades, 20 years, today, Wi-Fi is not only good to have, but a must to have, and become one of the key factors for the business success, even across all different industries. I just want to give you one example of our, it's really a customer example, you know, we have a very large e-commerce customer and they run the whole network inside their distribution center with MIST. And they run robots in the distributing center, you know, to help packaging and the shipment. So what they told us, if the network, if the Wi-Fi connection uh, stops for five seconds, the robot will just get stuck there. If one robot uh, stop, then all of the neighboring robots will also just stop. So they can. So this will certainly delay the you know packaging shipment and finally cause potential business loss because you know their customer can return the package if it's uh, delayed. So they actually can translate each of the just like uh, each of this minute or hour of the network incident into really the dollar numbers for their business loss. And then the number we heard actually is around twenty million, more than twenty million dollar business, potential business loss for one hour of the network, uh, you know, uh, incident. So this is really the business impact and also the opportunity for this area. So as an individual, probably most of the experience with network is about Wi-Fi. You know, when you go to your office, you just connect your phone with your corporate Wi-Fi. 
But uh, and you know, this just shows like uh, when the network sucks or you have a, a problem with connecting to the network, you always think it's a Wi-Fi problem, which is not true. 50% of the Wi-Fi problem, but uh, actually most of the time, or even the other half of the time, it's more beyond the Wi-Fi. So this graph shows this end-to-end -end diagram of what the enterprise network infrastructure looks like. You can see there are many segments, they're wireless. This is what you experience as uh, individuals. Behind there, there's a wire, there's a firewall, you know, sd van and finally a mix of this uh, data center, private and public cloud. So unfortunately, this end-to-end -end network so far today is still designed as most of the places is a single point of value, which means if any of the hub has a problem, it will impact the end user experience. So this is really, and also um, with the traditional human driven uh, operational, the network operational uh, procedure, if any of this problem happens, it may take hours or even days, sometimes a couple of days to really find the root cause of the problem and remediate the problem. So as I mentioned before, all this can cause a business loss. So this is the reason we created this uh, actual feature called Maris. Our goal, which targets to automatically detect, troubleshoot, and uh, even remediate the problem. You know, this is the kind of the high level we call it a self-driving network. So, you know, before we jump, uh, jump, uh, do a deep dive of our model, you know, the ML ops, I want to really, you know, look at the high level of this uh, big data solution we create. So most of the enterprise solution is trying to solve this problem called finding the needle in the haystack. So it's really a data funnel from the input side that you want to take as much variety and the volume of the input data to enhance your visibility of the problem space. But on the output, on the bottom, you want to give user as compact and as price, as price actionable insights as possible. So rather than just providing user with overwhelming dashboards or even noisy events, you can see that's one layer in the middle. We added two more layers for the automated troubleshoot and the actions. As I mentioned, one big differentiator of this AI solution we created is to take automated action based on the ML result to remediate the problems. Yeah, this is uh, kind of the diagram of really the uh, components we build inside of this uh, self-driving network solution. This is called the Event Action Framework. First, it's uh, all built on top of the it's a cloud native solution. It's a SaaS offering for our customer. It's built on top of AWS and now moved to GCP, migrate to GCP. And uh, we use all of this open source big data and machine learning tools and the libraries. And there are really four layers we build here. First is data collection. And uh, one thing I want to point out there is we care about not only the network device, but also the user and application experiences. You know, we collect a lot of data to cover that. The second layer is event generation in which we use various type of the supervised and unsupervised model to really collect the events and the signals. And anomaly detection is one big part of that. The third piece is the diagnosis. The goal is to use different uh, special and temporal correlation models to really find the root cause of the, of the incident. What uh, happened in your network caused this incident? Finally, based on the root cause, you know, we can either take automated action if we have the control of the device. If not, if it's in the neighboring system, we give you the suggested actions to guide them, you know, step by step to remediate the problem. And finally, as Ibrahim mentioned, we also build a kind of an NLP based chatbot to help them more like the help desk people. When they, you know, you bring your laptop to them for any of the issues, they can just talk with a bot to get the answer probably in a couple of minutes. So this is a high level picture of this self-driving solution we build. And next, I'm going to hand over to Ibrahim to talk about uh, that uh, anomaly detection use case here. Okay. 
Awesome. Thank you, Jisheng, for the uh, introduction and passing the big picture. So in this section, I would like to pass how we are building anomaly detection and we leverage that into production environment. So uh, the first thing is that anomaly detection is really used uh, in our use case is trying to detect some temporal spatial information anomalies which happen uh, throughout our system. Uh, hypothetically, we are looking at this very uh, well-defined anomalies. However, this is not really the case. So in our case, uh, anomaly detection help us a lot for monitoring in the scale that we are monitoring. So it helps us to have the paradigm of proactive monitoring rather than waiting for people, customers to call us and make a complaint. In a lot of cases, we catch a problem without even being a problem before it's getting a problem. So uh, the journey of anomaly detection at MIS has been, we started with some rule-based heuristic models and like people should be connected for the majority of time, putting some threshold rules there, but soon it failed. And then we moved to more statistical models, moving average, online ADI models, and none of them they were really able to um, pass the expectations. Uh, essentially, the false positive is a killer factor for us, and we have to be very cautious on this one. LSTM neural network was the first time that we were able to pass something that everyone was happy about that, very precise, and also with very low false positive uh, signals. Uh, okay, so uh, anomaly detection in practice is uh, baselining the key performance indicators that we have. So in our use case, we have tens of thousands of sites that we want to monitor. And if you, uh, I pass some examples here. As you can see, we have a wide range of variety of patterns that we have. So you can think about warehouses, addition was giving examples. We have offices, we have shopping centers and many different type of patterns we experience. So some of them have seasonality factors. Some of them, they don't have anything specific. So that, that's something. That, on the other hand, there is no one single uh, metric that people care about. Uh, it's a combination of metrics that uh, people kill all together, right? So uh, to that purpose, we are uh, designing anomaly detection about a multivariate time series where the input is a vector of time, uh, uh, vector at each time. So then uh, comes that, what feature do people care about? Uh, this is a very uh, important question when you want to design anomaly detection. Specifically, if you think about that, everything that we discuss here as a data scientist is in the realm of uh, statistical analysis. Essentially, we are capturing a statistical anomalies. However, people care about user impacting anomalies. So to close the gap, you have to work very closely with user to make sure that you are covering all the cases that they care about. And uh, for my case, I have worked very closely with customers. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, <laughs> my nephew is here. I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, this is the type of challenges that we have with online presentation. Hold on. Give me. Sorry, I apologize. That's my nephew. Okay. So uh, back to the talk. So in our case, I have to work very closely with customers to make sure that I'm covering uh, parameters that they care about and capturing the key performance indicators. So uh, in, uh, in the case that we are analyzing, like success and failures seems like trivial things that we want to monitor. We call it SLE service level experience features. And then we had some spatial features here. Uh, you can think about uh, like when failures happen, say that you have one fa uh, client that is failing 100 times, it's very different from the time that you have 100 uh, failing clients, right? To distinguish, we are adding these spatial features. So like the unique number of clients, unique impacted clients and so forth. And the other thing that we have is that state of the uh, network. For example, if network is failing on authentication, it's very different from the network that is failing on association. So not all the failure types are the same for network admin. So we added this state feature to that purpose. And the other thing here is that, uh, like you saw in the example that I passed, is that we have seasonality factors like daily or weekly. And in all type of models that we uh, try, 
uh, models have short memory about remembering this uh, trend and seasonality factor. To that purpose, we explicitly added some seasonality factor, in this case, like hour of day and day of week, to pass these uh, uh, seasonality factors. Okay, and now comes challenges about the ML part. So one part is that, first of all, what is abnormal? Essentially, anomaly by definition is such a rare event that you don't know ahead of time what you are expecting. So this is some challenge that we have to face. The other thing here is that this is not a very well-defined supervised problem. You don't have a good well-defined labels here that cat and dogs that you can go ahead and classify them. So to add to these challenges, what we did is that we decoupled the prediction and detection. Essentially, we try to see what we can do about uh, prediction and try to use that prediction to make some detection. So we change the paradigm rather than predicting what is abnormal, we try to predict what is normal. And then when you have normal, uh, when you're trying to predict normal now out of the blue, you have a lot of label data. You can't use the self-supervised or semi-supervised to predict at each time stamp what is happening next time stamp. So now you have implicit labels for your data. The other challenge that we have to address for anomaly detection is about confidence. Anomaly detection is all about confidence. So no matter what model you are training, it's gonna make some prediction. But the fact is that the important fact here is that how confident is the model about its prediction? Is it certain or is it uncertain? Is it taking any risk, right? So somehow we have to add the notion of confidence to our models. It does make sense, like uh, think about that, if a model is predicting zero, is it between negative one and one or is it between negative 100 and 100? So you have to have some notion, what is the output distribution? When you are using neural network to make uh, 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 to have some confidence in your prediction, it's not very trivial to add that notion to neural network. So, one of uh, use cases, one of uh, one one of uh, just not many of uh, neural networks that have this idea of confidence integrated in them is Bayesian neural networks. And in Bayesian, you're trying to add probability distribution concept to neural networks. So and it turned out that when we are adding drop out to neural network, somehow we are adding Monte Carlo sampling from our neural networks. So what people do in this case is that they try to, when you train a model, you train it with uh, drop out. And when you go to inference, you take that drop out uh, off of your network and you try to make a prediction. So but what you can do is that you can keep the drop out even during the inference and then make samples from the output. So rather than just making one uh, inference, make the number of inferences. Now you are taking sample from the output and then you can use it to uh, get the probability distribution of the output of the model, right? Uh, to give it in practice, in uh, testing, I try to use a sine wave testing. Since data that we have, it has some type of seasonality factor, and sine wave is a very good thing for testing here. So I was using a simple sine wave uh, signal here and was trying to see if the model is capable of handling the output and give us a good uh, prediction interval. As you can see, the gray area is our prediction interval. The blue line is the real value. Uh, as you can see, like the interval, pre, uh, the prediction interval is not really that tight. In fact, it's a very wide margin that we are passing. So it doesn't seem very good uh, model, in fact, for us. Uh, to improve that one, uh, we had a novel model here. So we tried to train the model with confidence. So I'll, I'll explain this one. So. Uh, the reason that the model was not able to capture the behavior, the probability distribution of output was the inherited uh, complexity of the neural network, the inherited uncertainty of the model by itself. So you have thousands of, hundred thousands of millions of parameters that you want to figure out. So the model is uncertain about those parameters. And then uh, you are making uh, drop out as sampling from the network is not just 
taking sample from the output is taking sample from the whole network, right? So you are taking uncertainty of the model into what you are trying to take sample of, right? So uh, to overcome this uh, challenge, I introduced the idea of training with confidence. So in this case, what I do is that at each time step, I have a sliding window that, and then it's trying to find the maximum, the average, and the minimum of the values there. And a lot of time is really about time coherence of the signal that you're monitoring. And then now you are trying to have three values for each prediction that you make. So then uh, at each time step, we are predicting the augmented uh, output, not really one single value. We are using three values for each prediction. And when I put it in the sine wave test, you see that the, uh, the interval, the prediction interval is very tight really, and it's following the real signal very closely. And so, and that's the model that we use for our prediction and our detection. Okay, so uh, then uh, just putting that into the uh, some type of predictive model, so we had the vector input, so and it goes through the out, uh, predictive model, and we are trying to pre uh, predict what would be the output in the next time step, right? And in our case, we are using augmented uh, output, essentially the minimum, the average, and the maximum thing. So for this predictive model, I use BioLSTM model, a very simple BioLSTM, in fact, here. So we have around 100 hidden nodes, each uh, each of LSTMs get 50 hidden nodes. We have a recurrence of 12, essential. It means that we look at last 12 hours. In our case, we aggregate the data hourly. I'll, I'll explain about why we are going with hourly toward the end of this session. And then we make a prediction for the next time step. And then the next layer is a drop out to make the network robust. And then we have a dense layer. Is my <laughs> I'm sorry. It seems that my nephew want to play really. Uh, okay, so uh, then we have dense layer to map uh, the uh, to the number of outputs that we want to the uh, dimension that we want. In overall, we have something around twenty seven thousand parameters. Uh, reasonably very small model. Okay, so. We change our detection so far to a prediction problem. So now uh, we are trying to predict what is happening in the next time step. Here we have some examples of what has happened uh, for like different sites. So like one site that you can see the first uh, graph at top at right. So it's a very non-stationary thing. This is one of cases that like the uh, classical uh, models have really difficult time in modeling this behavior. But uh, by adding the seasonality factor and time parameters and the nature of LSTM, we were able to capture what is happening with these sites. And as you can see, uh, the interval and also the prediction has followed the real signal very closely. The uh, second one and the first one are cases that most likely traditional uh, models can capture. However, uh, here also we have very good performance, specifically if you look at this one, like we are following uh, noise very well. Sorry, just give me another <laughs> second. Uh, now you can hand over, let uh, him talk about the remaining of your presentation. Uh, maybe like a while we are taking some break here. If you have any questions or anything, you can put it in the chat room now. I think we have probably um, another 10 minutes, maybe a little bit delayed, 10 minutes on the ML offside. Really talking about now is the, the theory piece and we're going to talk about the productization. The main challenge here, you know, for this model is really, you know, this is an NCOFI model. We have to train one model per customer per site. Even you think some of the retail customer like Walmart, is, uh, it's not a one model for all of this. For the better sensitivity, we have to train one model each site. And we end up have to train in more than 15,000 uh, neural networks models every round in the cloud. I think Ibrahim is going to cover some details about that. Uh, sorry, everyone, I apologize for this one, for the inconvenience. 
So uh, let's go back to the, uh, I see that there are some questions. I think that it's easier if I take questions toward the end of the Yeah, time. please go ahead, Ibrahim. Let's finish all of this. I think we're a little bit delayed here already. Okay, sure. So uh, now uh, the summary of this one is that now that we have moved to prediction, now we can talk about the prediction error. In, in this case, we have a very good performance. In fact, we have one to 5% of normalized mm -hmm. error. And this is a very uh, good performance that we are achieving. However, we don't forget that we are talking about anomaly detection. We have to map this one to anomaly detection. The thing that is happening here is that now we have trained models, hundreds of models, and we are evaluating performance of sites every hour, right? So it means that we have a lot of in independent prediction across sites, right? When you have that many independent uh, predictions, so you will end up with a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And when you have this for error, I mean, so when you have this uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution, then it's easy really to go and think about three or five sigma rules. Now, what is happening is that, so you have uh, this probability distribution for error, a Gaussian uh, probability distribution for error, and then you can now see who is deviating from the three or five sigma rules for the multivariate distribution. And that's how we are mapping our prediction to detection, right? And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see like how signal is uh, really distributed, pretty much more or less is a very sharp spike at the middle. And then you have the, uh, it's like, uh, became very fast. So uh, now talking of this one, that uh, that's what we have done for the model. And now we want to go ahead and deploy that into production and scale that across all the uh, systems that we have. From the pipeline perspective, the technology stack, we are a shop for open source systems. So we are using Kafka to pass these messages and events and process, uh, get that to where we want to process them. We have the secure uh, uh, backup system where we are trying to back up our data, our Kafka into S3 in our case, or storage in, uh, through GCP. And then we have a Spark job on EMR trying to read and process data from S3. We have Airflow for scheduling all the things that we do. And then when we process the result, we uh, persist that whether in Elasticsearch or uh, write that back to Kafka or persist that in uh, S3 again. So the model life cycle here, so more or less this is a generic life cycle. We have the training, we have verification, serving, and feedback. So for the training process, we have long-term retrieval of uh, data that we have. For our case, for example, we can go far as, uh, far as like two months or more. And then uh, for verification, however, it's not very trivial how should we process this one. Uh, if you think about this one, we had unsupervised system. And when we have unsupervised model, we don't have really label to go and verify the model against those labels. Uh, to do so, uh, we try to use the notion of global intelligence that we have and try to use that uh, knowledge. Uh, I'll explain uh, each section in details in following slides. And then we have the serving model. For serving, this is a short time retrieval that we are retrieving, something around 12 hours that uh, we were designed the model for. And then we have the feedback. This is where human is in the loop. And then we have human interaction mostly happening through the whole uh, ecosystem. The model training. Uh, so here in the right hand, uh, you can see that first we have data is read uh, from S3 uh, buckets and it goes to EMR cluster, and then in, on each executor, then data goes to each executor based on the site ID that we have. And each executor loads TensorFlow and train a model for one specific site. So in this case, we have many small uh, models, right? So we are training uh, distributed, but we have a small models trained on each executor. And then when the model is trained, we persist data into S3 bucket, the binary uh, uh, format of the model into S3. 
So that job, since we can go very far, like two months worth of data for that job, it could be a weekly training or it could be triggered on demand. So uh, like I uh, show you one case that we have triggered on demand and why we have done that. Uh, the other thing to pay attention here is that the way that we are distributing is that we are distributing training, but we are training single model on each executor. The alternative of this one is that if you had one big model and you want to distribute training for one single model, that would be a different paradigm. And in fact, we are using that one for a different problem, the problem of outlier detection, where we are training a very universal model, a big universal model, and we need, have a lot of data. So we are split, uh, we are distributing the training for that one single model. Now it comes to model verification. We have trained and now we want to verify whether this is a good model or not, then we have done a good job in training or not. So as I said, this is unsupervised model. We don't have label really to go verify against of that. But what we have here is that the notion of global and versus local intelligence. We have trained models uh, at, in many different batches in history, uh, like in past. So for example, last few years, we have a trained model every week. Now we have an idea, how would we the error for each training batch, right? And now we have a new batch of train. That is the local intelligence that we have. So we want to somehow to verify if uh, the train is normal or not, we can go ahead and try to statistically match uh, the behavior of these two uh, set of uh, uh, like the knowledge that we have. Now we have to map that knowledge to some type of distribution. We are using empirical probability distribution and we are comparing uh, the, the local probability distribution, the, the most recent batch of training with what we have done in past few months. And we try to see if everything seems normal. And that's how we are really verifying. To do that, we are using uh, KL divergence, essentially it shows how far these two probability distributions are from each other. And to that practice, for most of the time, we can do that without any human supervision. And uh, so uh, not always, but for most of the time, we don't really have anyone really go and interact with this system. Uh, and then it comes the model serving. So that's the serving for the serving. What we do here is that we are reading the uh, uh, data, the short term. This is a mini batch. So we are looking at short term data. Uh, we are uh, reading from S3 buckets here, though it goes through the EMR cluster. Each executor uh, fetches the corresponding model for that site and then uh, serve for that specific model that is designed for each site and make some predictions. Some of them, they are normal and some of them, they are abnormal. Like you can see that here we have at the lower uh, part, we have one anomalous site that we have detected. Uh, we have decided to go with hourly data. Essentially, this hourly data was not really a constraint of the system, like the pipeline. It was a constraint of the uh, precision that we want to have. We want to have very high precision, very low false positive thing. So it, when you are talking about uh, false positive and the confidence of the signal is that if you have the good signal to noise ratio. So uh, it was some... Uh, uh, design decision that really we ended up with hourly. In other different models, like outlier detection that I was talking about, we go really very uh, short uh, time window, as uh, low as few minutes. Then uh, the the part that is not very trivial, really how we have to handle it, it needs human interaction, it's not automated completely, is uh, where we are integrating the feedback into our system. A lot of times, uh, I mean by feedback, like negative when we are uh, failing at detection or maybe we have false positive. So it requires debugging and a lot of times it end up with revising hyperparameters in our case, like whether verification parameters, like the uh, models that we have verified, uh, they have changed, like uh, one of the cases that we have recently involved changing hyperparameters for verification was that after pandemic, the, the coefficients of training are different from what we have uh, before pandemic. And no, then I had to go ahead and try to limit the time window that we go back for the global intelligence. 
and sometimes it's a model adjustment, like what we are trying to predict as output uh, or what we are really passing as input. Like the feature selection at the beginning was a, a conclusion of uh, trying to pass seasonality factor and then the added explicit seasonality factor. So uh, I want to wrap up my talk with some uh, graph from uh, how we are scaling here. So uh, more or less, we are uh, growing the number of side, uh, side growth is having a linear pattern here. So in the uh, top, you can see that the number of sites are increasing almost linearly. And then we have automatic scaling, which can conclude to having a constant time training. And the second uh, graph that you see here, more or less for all the training, no matter how many sites we have, we have less than uh, around 20 minutes of training time for the whole, sorry, uh, serving time for the whole, uh, I made a mistake here, not the training, it's the serving time <clears throat> for uh, serving all the sites. And as you can see, this is a uh, constant time. The, the most important factor for the whole practice of anomaly detection for us, it was the complexity of uh, operational complexity where user need really now we get uh, alerts and now we have to go and analyze animals. And what we can see here is that we have a constant time complexity here. Number of animals are very constant, uh, uh, like despite the fact that we have a linear increase in the number of sites that we have, the number of animals are more or less constant here. Uh, we have this uh, spikes here, and this is of cases that uh, like required human intervention here. That was the case that one of the big customers with many sites decided to change some parameters about their site. And so it introduced man-made anomalies to the network and it increased the uh, serving time and also the number of animals that we have seen. And that was my last uh, uh, slide. So thank you for being patient and I apologize for the inconvenience. So now I would like to open it to questions. So Jishan, do you want to uh, go through questions and? Uh, uh, we have, uh, I, I just uh, try to cover most of the questions. There's not many actually uh, in the chat room. And uh, there's a new one coming in. Did you have set the metrics for each model? Uh, so the so the model is like each model, not specifically, we have all this aggregate values. So like for verification of the training job, we are using this global pro uh, like probability distribution. This is uh, global. And even for verification, like training thing. Uh, so we are training uh, model per site. So like we are taking into account the loss for each site. However, verifying the whole training batch is a global thing. So uh, it's a combination of both. Really. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, how do you handle CI/CD for your pipeline? Actually, that's a very good one. You know, this uh, um, um, first, this is how we build the product here. And uh, our data scientist team actually have data engineer, even DevOps people in the team. So we take the end-to-end -end ownership of the product. Um, actually, we even directly deal with the customers to, to really understand the problem. So for CI/CD, we leverage almost all of this uh, cloud-based tools. Like we use, uh, like Ibrahim actually showed, all of the graph are from SignalFX. So we have different metrics from the system level, like say how many nodes we launch, how long it takes to finish the training, you know, whether the verification pass or not, all of this. All these different metrics sent to the signal FX. That is where we kind of monitor the system. Um, any other question which we did not uh, address here or any new questions? So there was one question about the mean, max, and average thing. So uh, we tried two different paradigm here. One was that so it, uh, since we have aggregation of parameters here, so. We, uh, the whole notion of uh, using this sliding window was that somehow you're trying to make the system stationary around one point. When you are adding this uniform distribution of the window, you're adding some uh, like uniform uh, error to the model and you make it real distribution. So you're removing the starting point there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, 
in this case, uh, in this case, so uh, like the maximum and the minimum thing that is happening is that uh, since if you imagine that your uh, output is coherent over time, so it should have some uh, very good correlation with the next value. So uh, it shouldn't really jump up and down. And that's the feature that we are using really for adding the mean and the max value here. So essentially we change our model to pre rather than predicting one single point, we are trying to predict an interval. And that's really uh, how we are handling that. Yeah, most of the time actually, uh, okay, there's a new question. What was the main metrics? Oh, the kind of the metrics, is that the FP rate? Yeah, the false positive rate. Uh, yeah. So uh, the false positive rate is uh, that we have measured that in uh, snapshots. So for example, initially when we started uh, the effort, we were passing, say that we had detected uh, 20 number of anomalies. And then we were communicating that back to uh, the customer to make sure that this type of animals are real. So in fact, through practices that we had is around 100% really accurate. Uh, so. Uh, not all the anomalies are critical to be processed immediately, but uh, for more than 99% of models, uh, like alerts that we have, they are real and they are actionable. Yeah. So the next question, I'm, I'm trying to understand the problem you guys will solve. I, I think, uh, yeah, sorry for the, maybe we did not really give the full picture. I saw a couple of questions uh, around that. First, you know, this ML model, this anomaly detection model is just the one piece of really big uh, uh, solution, the end-to-end -end solution we build. The really the business problem we try to solve is to really detect, uh, troubleshoot and remediate end-to-end -end network problem. Because just as I said in the beginning, we don't want to tell the help desk it's not a wi problem. We want to really pinpoint where the problem and what's the root cause. So, Actually, anomaly detection, it's not an anomaly itself is not, we don't send anomalies direct to the user because it can be noisy. We actually have we'll build another layer of troubleshooting uh, really to map anomalies to the root cause to correlate with the network attributes and even potentially with uh, you know, network change to find really what's the root cause causing this anomaly and then take corresponding remediation actions. That's a full workflow, you know, but uh, anomaly is detecting is just the trigger of that process. Yeah, to answer your question, our goal is the end goal is to really to remediate those problems. And then we talk about this, this is called a self-driving network. Our goal is to remediate the problem before user complain with the, with the help desk. So like I think uh, when the network's down, it takes them maybe a couple minutes to really click around before you go to the help desk. This is really the time interval for us to take to solve this problem, potentially re remediate the problem, you know, to eliminate the customer support or operational ticket overhead there. So anomaly detection is the beginning of uh, trying to detect and bubble up some spatial or temporal information like if some failures happen or something different than normal behavior has happened but then we have the whole pipeline after that trying to narrow down the scope of the issue and that right. troubleshooting is happening and to that purpose then it's animal detection is automating uh, detection and then it goes to the rest of process how to go ahead and try to understand the scope of the issue and then try to remediate the issue. Yeah, at the end, I think uh, half of the people probably already uh, gone for the session. Thanks a lot for your time. You know, at the, it's the first time you know, we presented here. Okay, there's one more question coming. Uh, you, have a slide showing, you have a slide showing you use the Spark plus TensorFlow for model serving. Could you please elaborate on that a little bit more? Ibrahim, can you go back to that slide? Yeah, the spark, no, the spark piece is the, yeah. So is the end user of the model calls an API and the point that triggers a spark job? No, we actually use the airflow in this case to trigger, to launch the, this is the, the we, airflow is a scheduler. 
we there are two kind of the model uh, training. It can be triggered by the scheduler, the periodic scheduler, or it can be triggered on demand. So in that case, all of this training is launched from the airflow. Did we answer your question? Anyway, uh, I think uh, thanks a lot for your time. I know some, maybe some other sessions are going on. Uh, we will stay a little bit longer here. And also if you're interested about uh, any details, uh, you can either connect with us or ping us on LinkedIn for following the discussion. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you, everyone. And stay safe and enjoy your day. Yeah, stay safe there. Thank you. I think Ibrahim, there's no more questions. We probably, it's also um, over one hour. So we probably can leave here. Sure, absolutely. Okay, good job there. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.